Okay, in this um, mini lecture, we're going to talk about the two major aspects that we have uh, which define the boundaries and the characteristics of culture. And those are basically the material and the non material cultures or aspects of culture uh, that define any particular culture, any particular uh, subculture or counterculture or uh, a uh, as we defined it in the previous lecture. Uh, the material culture is actually the easier one to understand. It, uh, it has to do with all of the examples and all of the things that we have in our culture which have a symbolic meaning to it and that we use. Uh, the natural and uh, human created objects uh, which have certain sort of meaning to it. Uh, certainly if you take an iPod, that has certain meaning to it in our culture. Uh, or uh, the fact that I'm standing behind a lectern has meaning in our culture. So these are objects that have both obvious and practical uses and they are giving, uh, given a certain amount of um, meaning. Sometimes these meanings are fleeting. Uh, for instance, uh, as we have in our textbook, the idea of the Hummer, which had a huge amount of meaning when it came out, being a, uh, uh, associated with the military, and it was strong, and it go out into the uh, out into the uh, to the wilderness. But it lost its, uh, and, and therefore became a status symbol, being also very a, a luxury car. But it lost its meaning when it also became known as something which was a terrible gas guzzler. So uh, everything in our culture that we had that any would be part of that material culture. Foods also. Um, eggnog has a, you don't normally drink eggnog in the, in the summer, although it does have, seem to have some sort of meaning during the month of December. Uh, so food can also have certain meanings uh, uh, and certain connotations. Uh, you don't normally have a whiskey sour uh, on a Monday, on a Tuesday morning, or Monday morning for that matter. Uh, but it might be appropriate when you're going out to a cocktail party. Uh, that is the material culture. A much more broader and much more complex aspect which needs more categorization is the non-material culture. Okay, uh, And the non-material culture will include the non-physical creations that people can't really necessarily hold or see, but uh, they do define an individual's relationship to himself to the culture and to other uh, and to other people within the culture, uh, it's uh, sometimes the obviously the um, material culture will affect the non-material, and the non-material will affect the material culture. Like for instance, there is, used to be a very strong value of eating dinner together in the family. The family came home and ate dinner together. Now, the new aspect of the, material, of the material culture was the microwave, and the microwave enabled everybody to fix their own food. Uh, even a small child can stick his food into the, uh, into, the, into the microwave. Now, there were other factors, such as the necessity for, uh, for both parents to go working, and the different economic factors, and different cultural factors, but bottom line was you didn't have to eat together. No, we didn't need one person to prepare a meal for everybody that it, 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 uh, in order for people should eat. That wasn't necessarily the most efficient way of doing it. The most efficient way of doing it was to buy something and put it in the uh, and put it in the microwave. Now, of course, that trend started beforehand all the way in 1954 when they came out with a TV dinner where was, one was able to put, put a whole meal into the, into, the, uh, into the oven for 15, 20 minutes and take it out and eat it and sit in front of the television. But it became solidified uh, and the culture became one that we don't necessarily sit down and eat dinner together. Uh, and that became cultural fact in American society today, which doesn't necessarily mean that's the same thing in other societies, and even other modern societies or westernized societies. Uh, in order to continue with this, we want to, uh, we want to talk about different, uh, five different levels of, uh, or definitions that we need to use in order to understand the non-material culture. Again, these are things that we, are ways of thinking about or such things like that. Now, the first thing we would say is a belief. 
Okay. Uh, obviously, it's not something we, we might know in sociological terms. A uh, belief is something we know to be true. Um, we know it to be true about the way the world operates. Now, is it necessary? Really, is it true? True in the metaphysical sense? Probably not. But it's not important because it is true in our cultural sense. So um, it's true in uh, it, it, the ideas of of belief can be based in faith or experience or tradition or anything. Um, but the the fact that it is a belief has a great amount of um, influence on the uh, relationships we're going to have uh, with others. Uh, a profound, profound effect. Uh, the idea that uh, a person cannot get a good job, a belief, the American believes that you can't get a good job if you don't go to school and get yourself a degree. That's a belief. Statistically, it might not even be true. One might be able to go to get a good job without getting a, a college degree. Or you might not be very smart if you can't get a college degree. A friend of mine recently had uh, uh, did some therapy counseling with a 60-year-old man. The first thing he told to my friend, he says, I'm not, I'm not a very bright person. Uh, he says, why? He says, well, because I didn't go to college. Uh, he was 60 years old. He had, and so what did he do? Well, he um, opened up a, uh, I think it was a, a bakery or something like that when he was 18 years old because he failed, he, he dropped out of college. And by the t at this time, at 60, he had just sold his business for um, eight and a half million dollars. Uh, so my friend asked him, so well, how did you do that? He said, well, I had to negotiate. Well, you negotiated your deals and you bought, you bought other companies. Well, what did you do? Well, I had my lawyers next to me. He said, but I'm not a very bright person, so I really uh, had to negotiate and talk to other people about it. He says, but you actually did the negotiations. Yeah. yeah, but I'm not really a very bright person. Why not? Well, because I never finished college. So is that necessarily true? No, but it was a belief that he had and he grew up with. Uh, so that would be a belief and it actually uh, influenced the way he related to the world. So that's the idea of beliefs. Uh, a, a second idea would be the concept of values. In other words, a non-material culture uh, puts upon a, a uh, an idea of, of the value of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, such, such things as obedience and freedom, health and fitness, modesty, honesty, self-esteem. I mean, these are possible things which we call the values. Uh, it, it, it tells us what is, might be important in your life. It might not be for somebody else, but it are, they are things which you choose within the framework of being important. Is the value of modesty something important in your life? Is the value of freedom more important in your life? Um, and they are defined by the culture. Certainly in, for instance, uh, the idea in maybe in North Korean culture, the idea of freedom is not something which is excuse me, highly valued, but order might be highly valued. I haven't been in North Korea, but that certainly is, um, uh, is important, more important there. Than, and, and certainly there's, or the um, modesty, it was much more important in uh, Saudi Arabian culture than the freedom. And in American culture, freedom is more important than modesty. So that's the idea of values and how they can uh, um, be integrated into, into our concepts of culture. Let's talk about norms. Um, and, and norms could be written or unwritten rules that specify behaviors as appropriate, inappropriate, according to particular 
uh, situation. Now, these can go into two different categories, folkways and moors. And folkways are like important or unimportant uh, aspects of, of behavior, uh, which if somebody does it, they'll look funny at you. Uh, but that's not thing that thrown out. Moors is um, more as central, something which is essential to the well-being of the group itself. So for instance, if um, hey, you're at a friend's house and you just had a nice good meal and you make, make a great big burp at the end of the meal, I mean, maybe somebody's going to say to you, oh, disgusting, or something like that, or look at you funny and, you know, well, what do you want? I like, just drank a big glass of Coca-Cola. That's what's going to happen. But you're not likely to get thrown out or even uninvited next time. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in Japan and you did the same behavior, well, then you're being polite because it's, you're showing that you appreciated the meal. Uh, and that's just, and, but if you didn't, you still probably would be invited. Uh, you may be a little bit rude by not bel by birching, but belching, but hey, not a big deal. On the other hand, moors are much more strict. Um, if you uh, walk into a church without your clothes on, you're likely not to be able to, to be invited back there again. Um, if you um, uh, wipe your nose on your on your host uh, tablecloth, you're likely not to be uh, um, invited there again. These are like mores. They're essential to the, and they're considered as essential to the well-being of the uh, of the group itself. Uh, further, so those are the two things which we, which will put into the ideas of, um, of, of mores. Two more, the idea of, the, of, simple, uh, of, of symbols, there, there's one symbol. That's the symbol which I have from saying A-OK, -okay, which I mentioned last time, but there are a lot, a lot of symbols uh, which one might, uh, one might use to being good or bad or happy or unhappy. Um, and it's it's it, it people sign the name and a meaning, and it's but it's not evident because from what it is in of itself. Uh, if I were to um, go into a courtroom, I would be asked to take off my hat as a sign of uh, respect for the court. One, the, the judge will not let me sit with a hat on the court. However, in uh, in Jewish culture, then one keeps his something on his head to show respect for God. So I have a type of hat on my head all the time. It happens to be that if I were to put on a large hat in the court, they would tell me to take it off, and this would be loud because we're in the United States, but maybe in some other cultures it has been that even that sort of the, 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 the skull cap which I wear is not even accepted, and I would have to take it off, otherwise I would be in contempt of court because it's disrespectful. What is it intrinsically disrespectful about your head being covered or uncovered? Nothing's intrinsic about it. It's that it's a symbol that we accept. And of course, language itself is a bunch of symbols that we agree upon using. The sounds themselves don't really mean anything, but we uh, ascribe to them sound, the, to the to meanings, to the sounds. So that we have words that in one language mean one thing, and another language means another. The door is some sort of thing that we, the word door is not intrinsically a portal, a way for going in and out from one room to the other. In Hebrew, the word door means generation. And you stay in a generation from the beginning to the end. So it's not moving from one place to another. Um, and, but the word door itself has ascribed within the culture a particular meaning. Sometimes has emotional meanings to it also. And sometimes with a lot, a lot, a lot of words gives a lot of meanings to it. That will also give us a lot of a, a more depth in that culture itself. So, uh, and that, by the way, which we will, which we can talk about, is called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Which means when there's more words, then there's more depth, a possibility to, uh, in, in, on that particular concept in that culture.